Welcome back, everyone. Since I started this channel, there's been a number of questions that have come my way and a number of people asking about a number of things. But one common concern that I get when it comes to uranium is that people are telling me I'm wrong because it won't happen yet. And while I love to hear about the different reasons why different people think it's wrong, often it comes back to one thing and one thing very specifically and that is people seem to refer me to um, a video or a podcast or something where the theory being discussed is called cut to kill and that is what i will discuss in this video so the author of this theory is a well-known gentleman by the name of marin katusa now I know a lot of people very much dislike certain things that he says. Personally, I don't think of him as a fool. I think he's a very smart person with unparalleled knowledge and insider access within the natural resource space. However, I do strongly agree with his cut to kill outlook on the uranium space and based on what is currently happening and what has been happening for the past few years. And this video will just show why. But again, I, it's not against the person, it's against the theory. So, so the basis of the theory is that Kazatomprom, which is backed by Russian influence, will try to seize control over the uranium market. And by doing so, they will they, were, they need to drive their competitors to the brink of bankruptcy in order to claw back or buy all the assets that they want. And then once they have the assets, once they have the market, they can proceed in the way they want, presumably allow the price up or drive the price up, but let's go with allow the price to get to where they'd want it. So if this theory is correct, the I think it stands to reason that the main two players that one need focus on in this scenario are Cameco and Kazatoprom, because most of the, the rest of the production is either from small producers here and there, mostly in the US, a few small producers, and a bunch of state-owned enterprises. Obviously, there's some other mines, but they're less likely to be influenced by near-term price moves and such. But Cameco and Kazataprom are the, well, Cameco is the biggest producer that is price sensitive and, to a degree. And the rest of the state-owned enterprises that are producing uranium for their own uses, well, they're unlikely to be driven out of money economically, I would say. So let's have a look at how Kazataprom would beat Cameco if they wanted to. Well, presumably, if they wanted to drive Cameco out of business, they would need Cameco to not be able to make money and make a profit. Okay, then they could try to drive them out of business if they had more staying power than Cameco, meaning if the prices remained low for a long time, because Adaprom could stay alive and Cameco could not. Okay, so if this were their goal, they could probably, they would probably be doing it by trying to increase production because to keep the price down. So this is the simplest strategy and seems to be uh, what cut to kill is implying. So let's have a look at what might be wrong with that. So as to the first point, let's have a look at Cameco's ability to quote unquote make money. So Cameco, firstly, is hedged. So you can see from their presentations or filings, whatever, that they're hedged, meaning that they are resilient to the spot price going down or up for, to a degree. The, the amount of money that they make based on their contracted price is not super relevant to near term moves in the spot price and they have their financial needs covered by contract price. 
So driving the price down, does it really hurt them? At this point, how much? And point number two, as we know, Cameco is actually a buyer in the spot market, and they have said in one of their presentations, there's more buying ahead of them than behind them. So if Kazataprom wanted to drive down the spot price to hurt Cameco, how exactly does that work when Cameco is buying a good chunk of their um, contracted pounds on the spot market? They actually benefit from lower prices. Next, we need to look at does Kazataprom really have more staying power than Cameco? Well, Kazataprom doesn't make enough money to pay pay their mandated minimum dividends. Meaning if they wanted to continue with these lower prices, they would be racking up debt in order to pay their dividend. Doesn't really sound like a show of strength to me, but I can understand how people would see things differently. Next, their production, is that a problem that is, peaked in 2016. Now I'm not saying it can't get higher than it was at its peak, I'm just saying that they've been guiding down their prior production guidance. This is a, they haven't been cutting production much, but this is a very curious thing to do if their intent was to drive down the price to drive their competitors out of business, especially considering their competitor have been shutting down production. Now, Kazataprom, when we look at their, also in their staying power, if you look at the production, it was supposed to peak in the mid 20s, mid 2020s that is. So, and then decline almost almost entirely, but not not really significantly over the next two decades. Meaning if Kazataprom really wanted to keep the prices down now to kill Cameco, they are doing this by expending their best assets and their most productive years in terms of spending money now to not make money and hope that their competitors aren't around in the future. It's up to you to decide if this makes sense. Now, just to quickly reiterate this, if Kazanaprom's goal was to increase production and drive Cameco down, wouldn't they be actually working on increasing production? They've been cutting workforce, cutting spending, and they've actually flexed down their production numbers in the past. Now, there's been some discussions as to whether they could or couldn't cut their production more. They have said, and a lot of smart people who work closely in the space have said that they probably could cut their production more, but that would involve renegotiating their subsoil use agreements, and so that might be difficult. But they haven't done that. so. In that way, there is a point they theoretically could be cutting production more, but they're already flexing down 20% from what they had planned before. And if you're thinking, okay, buddy, so it's not wrong, it just hasn't started yet, at the first sign of life, because the Kazakhs are gonna start their cut to kill strategy, and I'll say, well, what about the two year lag? because any money that's spent will only translate into production probably in two years in the future. Now you could say one year, you could say a year and a half, but realistically, the money hasn't been spent yet. And so once, this is more of a question of once the market turns, unless this is something that's supposed to be starting now or in the near future, in which case cut to kill would only be relevant in what, 2022, 2023. So I don't really see how anything that's happening right now would be the reason why uranium prices wouldn't move for only a year. Now, if you wanted to talk about the latter half of the 2020s and make some other argument, okay, but presumably if this was a near-term thing, we'd see it in the pipeline and really, you know, you could look at the pipeline, look at what everyone's saying they're doing. And if 
what's more, if we look at Cameco, how they're positioned right now, I think it could be argued that they're much more defensive than Kazatomprom. They have their contracts and they're actually buying from the spot price. So if the spot price would remain low for, I don't know, a decade, as long as Cameco still has the ability to contract, well, they're doing great because they're making the risk-free spread. Whereas Kazataprom's not necessarily, well, they're producing. So why would Kazataprom want to keep the price low so that they can sell their uranium on the spot market to Cameco? It, it doesn't really make sense. Now, I'm not saying Mr. Katusa doesn't make any valid points, because he does. Kazataprom was able to renegotiate the ownership of Inkai um, from 40% back to 60% on the cheap. However, this is, was at a time where Cameco's balance sheet was significantly less sure or strong than it was, or than it is. And also, if you look back at history, there's a number of transactions done at the bottom of markets that look like crazy prices. There's mines that have been sold for a dollar or $10,000 or whatever, really low prices when certain people were, when there was a balance sheet mismatch. And so it is a fair point that, that Kazataprom was very opportunistic and got back some ownership of Inkai, but we have to look at the surroundings also and what do they mean. Now, I know it's not cut to kill specific, but I know in the past Mr. Katusa has also made some uh, dollar bull arguments, very bullish on the dollar. Now, I get this argument and I've spoken about it in the past. If the US dollar goes up massively, it could make commodity prices hurt. And if the companies are laden with debt, it could make it even cha more challenging for them to have to pay it back. Now, the thing I would point out is if this dollar milkshake, it's a term for explosive higher dollar, but theory by someone, Brent Johnson, um, if this happens, the commodity prices across the board would be hit badly to crush. Now, maybe um, along with not being bullish now on uranium, um, the Mr. Katusa's view is that copper should be shorted, oil should be shorted, or not bought, or whatever, and every other economically, zinc, diamonds, whatever, everything should be sold. That would make sense if you were very bullish on the dollar. So we'll have to see, um, maybe that's part of the theory that doesn't get discussed enough, but you could also hedge this by playing currencies to a degree. So if, if that's the thesis, that's a different way to play it. But the, my point is simply that I'm not blind to this argument, I'm just don't see how it's uh, super uranium specific. I've also heard him make a number of references to miners' super ability to stay alive. I added the super, but they have great abilities to stay alive once in production. Now, okay, sure, fine. Let's say we don't see any more production cuts. I still don't really see how the market is going to balance itself by whatever's producing staying in production, even if Ranger and Kamenak weren't going out of production in a year, a year and a half. Um, at some point, the market is going to have to balance itself. And at that point, well, if I'm right, then there's going to require more production. So the miner's ability to stay alive while it hurt for a few years in the past I'm not sure how relevant it is going forward. Now, this isn't exactly related to cut to kill, but occasionally I've heard 
mention of the fact that using $50 economics for projects is an unfair way of presenting them to investors, as it's similar to using $2,500 gold. And this is very fair. This is true. And it's you have to recognize that the economics that the companies are using require a higher price. But part of that is, well, no one Okay, so there's one company, maybe two, that use economics at lower levels. But realistically, if you want more production, you're looking at $50. So it, it's fair to recognize that that isn't what it's worth today. That's what it might be worth someday. Very true. And it does present a bit of a rosy picture on some of these things. On the other hand, if you look at the stocks that the person making this argument has owns well what is what are they worth what could they be worth at today's prices if you look at uranium royalty corp which has been discussed well how many of the royalties that they own would go into production at less than fifty dollars so how much does this really matter same thing for the other ones do they can they go into production at those prices are they worth more than their current market cap at today's prices or even at $50? I see the point, but it's understood. So let's have a look at Aaron Katusa's uranium position. Now, he says not yet. And while I don't think that cut to kill is the reason why not yet, I can see it taking a bit longer. and. Honestly, I'm fine with that, and I just don't understand why he's talking about cut to kill as the reason why it's going to take a little bit longer. Now, in podcasts, I have seen him talk about Uranium Royalty Corp, and I believe I've seen two other equities that he's discussed. To my knowledge, he has personally not sold out of those equities. Maybe he has maybe not. But recently on Uranium Royalty Corp, so that's the one I'll talk about, um, it may be able to profit from if the weakness continues, maybe, if they can structure deals, if that makes sense for them and what they invest in. But my point being, if he still has one or two or three Uranium positions, don't mistake him for a Bear. So he, maybe he believes not yet. Maybe he has cut to kill as his reason. Maybe it's some other reason. But he does, it looks like, believe in uranium in the mid to longer term. Now, with all this cut to kill strategy and me talking about how some company might want to put Cameco out of business, I know a number of you own shares in Cameco. And while my defense here has been all over the place, I just wanted to point out that I don't think Cameco is really that much in danger. Because if you look at Cameco's, how they're positioned right now, if you wanted to kill them, it would be tough. They have hun only 150 million in net debt. They have a cash flow from Cigar Lake and from their trading operations. Their price hedged with their outgoing uranium they have a profitable non-uranium mining business and they are buying in this low price spot market. So if you're going to try to take them out of business, whatever strategy you come up with is going to need to be complex. And mainly you have to realize that their destiny is in their own hands. Because when you look at the cut to kill, what it would mean for Cameco is it would mean it's a strategy where Kazataprom it would be racking up debt to produce more so that they could keep selling into the spot market to crush the price so that Cameco would have to pay less for their purchases, which they sell into higher contracts, uh, making a better margin for them while Kazataprom depletes their assets and saves Cameco's. That is sounds to me like trying to kill someone by drowning them in your own blood. But 
it's possible, I suppose. Now, I did want to mention this one thing about another point that a number of people seem to be making that are thinking that Russia wants to take control of the uranium uh, sector. And that is that they think people think that Russia wants to control either cut to kill in this case or uranium in general. Now, I'm this, not saying this is a Marin Katusa point. I'm just saying that if Russia wanted to control all the uranium production or all that they could to take the West, sorry, yeah, to take the West out of it, why are they delaying Mukuju River, which is a uranium project in Tanzania, I believe, um, citing low prices as the cause for delaying it. And also, they don't really seem to be in a big hurry to advance the Elcon project. They delayed it by a decade. So, yeah, they're happy to produce for Rosatom for themselves, but saying that they want to ramp up production immediately to take over the market, it doesn't also seem to be what's going on. Now, if this were about the fuel cycle or something in the supply chain, that's a different argument than saying that Russia or Kazakhstan or whoever is trying to crush the U308 price. So if that's what it is actually about, then that's a different argument. However, I would like to point out or ask is our Russia and Kazakhstan combined able to produce enough uranium for everyone, even if they wanted to? And I'll let you answer that for yourselves. And this is even if the Kazakhs were ramping up production as much as they could right now, which again, are they? And moreover, if you look at right now, what's going on, who aside from China, is trying to ramp up any production. Because you have China trying to increase production out of Husab, and maybe Rossing once they can fit, take control and figure out what's going on there. But who else that cares about economics and cares about competition is trying to increase production right now? So in conclusion, I'd just like to ask, Mr. Katusa, what am I missing? I'm not saying that I'm smarter than you or better than math because you're probably much smarter and far better at math than I am. I know you have better contacts. I was just hoping you could explain to me how the cut to kill strategy makes sense today because I'm not seeing any of what the dangers would be are happening. And so I was just hoping that after focusing on these points, someone would be able to point out what is happening that is proving cut to kill and disproving the points I've mentioned here. So that's it for today. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed. And if you see a point where I'm wrong and you can explain to me where I'm wrong, don't feel bad, tell me. I'll enjoy figuring out what I don't know. And so if you know what I don't know, thanks for telling me. Have a great day.